Welcome back to Gems. My name is Melissa Mitchell from here in Australia, uh, Abundant Life Studio, social media marketing agency. We welcome you back wholeheartedly. Hope you are well. Uh, today, we're going to be doing t- a part two to The Purpose of Life by Jeffrey Lang. So if you watched part one, the first part to this uh, for Jeffrey Lang, who was a Christian, I believe. Uh, I always forget if he's Christian or Catholic. I think he was Christian. Um, being atheist, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I do get confused with Christian and Catholic because sometimes to me they, they're the same. I feel bad saying that, but I do forget. But uh, I believe he was Christian and then he went atheist and then he became Muslim. Uh, and he's got a really great story. I love listening to it. Um, so we got up to about 18, 19 minutes in before for part one. It was really fascinating. And he's about to answer a really, really poignant question. So I'm really keen to do part two. This part's going to be a little bit longer. Um, so buckle in because it's about to get really exciting. Um, and as an atheist, I'm really keen to to hear his questions because he's got some really good questions and a lot of questions that I myself ask as an atheist. Things like, well, if there is a God, then why does he make children sick? Why does a God give children cancer? As an atheist, these are questions that we ask. And then I'm interested to hear what he says about that, you know, becoming, you know, a Christian to um a you know atheist to then a muslim and if you listen to part one and if you if if you don't know of jeffrey lango and i've only learned of him since you know starting you know uh since doing gyms i didn't know his story it actually made me cry of, of the the abuse he had a very terrible father and a beautiful mother but a terrible father and so that's why he started asking questions well why why would god put this man on earth to treat me this way and to treat my mother this way with domestic violence. And um, it was really interesting. So I'm going to hit play in a minute and we're going to, um, you know, get stuck into that a little bit more um, and hear a bit more about what he has to say. And uh, as, as I always say, you know, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscription button um, before we get started. And of course, at the end, I'm going to give you, you know, what I thought of, of, of of the video uh the channel is islam on demand i really liked the part one that we watched uh on this and if you really like this then watch the next part as well um as i said this is going to be a little bit longer maybe around 30 or 40 minutes uh we'll see how we go we'll stop it and then we'll do part three as well so here we go we're going to push um plate for part two the purpose of life jeffrey lang if you haven't watched part one though pause this go back and watch part one and then come back and watch part two and then of course part three and so on. Right, here we go. Push play. We'll see what it's all about. And then I realized, of course, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. And that would happen several times as I read through the Quran. And sometimes I would just get into such, so 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 agitated agitated by by what what I read, read. I'd start start arguing arguing with this voice that's, that's, that I'm reading before me, that's calling to me. So we turn to the next verse. It turns out that the Quran just doesn't dismiss the question and starts to answer it a little bit. And in the next verse it says, and he taught Adam, God taught Adam, the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. So this verse is clearly referring to the previous one. But notice what it says. Now, from my own background, I remember Adam naming things. But it wasn't connected to any answer to any philosophical question. But here, notice what it says. And he taught Adam Adam the the names names of all things. And I realized already, just from the first verse, Mm. you got to read these verses very carefully because it's packed with a lot of symbolism and meaning. And he taught Adam the names of all things. So here we see Adam is not only just a creature who knows how to name things, who's acquiring the gift of language, but he's also a learning creature. God is teaching him. And right here, right in this verse, and it'll come even clearer in the subsequent verses, that the very first thing that that the Quran is going to emphasize here is man's intellect. He is a learning creature. He is taught. And what is he taught? What is is one of the great intellectual gifts he's He's given? given? In response to the angel's question, the gift of language. 
Because through language, mankind can not only learn, but he could learn things not only through his own experience, but he could learn things that other people have experienced of times and places that are yeah, hundreds, thousands of years and miles separated from yeah. him. And so that all our knowledge becomes cumulative. Every generation learning from the generation before it. I'm learning today from authors I read from other sides of the world that may have existed 2,000 years ago. And so we all contribute to our collective learning and knowledge. And so what I'll see later in the Quran, when the Quran will emphasize this again and again and again, like in one verse it says, read in the name of your Lord who created. Created a man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands the reader, for your Lord is most bountiful. Why is he most bountiful? What great gift did he give you? For he taught man the use of the pen, and through it taught him what he otherwise could not know. And time and time and time again, the Quran will call upon man to use his intellectual faculties and swear by his intellectual faculties and to, and to use them correctly as a, as, because, because they play a fundamental, fundamental role, role in, in guiding, guiding him to truth. I never came upon a scripture that puts so much emphasis on the correct use of our intellectual faculties, on the harnessing of reason in helping us attain to faith. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Okay, you have this objection to, you have this natural question about this creation of mankind. Here, this mankind is a, this is a human being, this human creature is a learning creature. He has many intellectual gifts. Here, I'm gonna place these things before you. Tell me their names if you are right about man. And what did the angels say? In the next verse they say, glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. They say this, would be, this task, this intellectual test that's put before them is beyond their grasp. Notice what they emphasize. We have no knowledge. This would take knowledge. This would take an intellect that they don't possess. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. You got it, it's easy for you. You have you're the knowing, the wise, you have knowledge, you have wisdom. But this would take knowledge and wisdom that is beyond us. And so in the next verse we read, and he said, oh Adam, tell them, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, notice how it's just like it's nothing for him. For mankind, he has this phenomenal ability. And when he had told them their names, as if it's just a triviality for man, he names them. Oh, Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and conceal? He was clearly going back to the angel's question. question. Yes, yes, you have these natural concerns about the creation of mankind. Yes, he could do these evil things. But look at this tremendous intellect he has. This, this is, is something, something you have overlooked look, that, that you haven't considered. And that's clearly the point of these verses. Even though I, under, I felt that the author didn't quite, uh, you know, it was as if I, I realized that he didn't, not, just didn't misunderstand the story. He was taking one of the great stories in the history of humankind, one of the fundamental greatest stories in the history of mankind and molding it and using it as a vehicle for an entirely original message. <clears throat> and God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal? In other words, didn't I tell you I know exactly what I'm doing? And then the next, and did I not tell you what I, that I know what you reveal and conceal? I looked at that what question did their, I mean, what did they reveal and what did they conceal? What did their question reveal and conceal? I thought about it for a minute. Oh, it's obvious. What did their question reveal? You just go back and look at the question. It revealed the sinful and sinister propensities of man. I mean, it's obvious, right? Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> You're starting to scare me. You're all looking very serious. Am I losing you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So, they revealed the sinister and evil propensities of man. But what did their question conceal? 
And all you have to do is think about it for a minute. The human beings, yes, they could do evil. Yes, they could do wrong. Yes, they could create misery. But they could also do exactly the opposite. They, they could, could choose, choose to do, to do evil. evil. They, they could, could choose, choose to do tremendous good. They could choose to do tremendous violence. They could choose to show tremendous compassion. They could choose to, be, to, you know, to live by falsehood. They could choose to live by the, the greatest truths. They could be terribly ugly. They could be terribly beautiful. And I, up until that point in my life, I, like the angels, had only saw one, half of, one side of the coin. And for the first time when I read that verse, believe it or not, it was an eye-opener for me. I had always been obsessed with the evil potentials of human beings. When I read that verse, I realized that, and I had a great example right in front of me with my own mom, I realized that I had been blinded by only one side of human nature. So we go on to the next verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis. Iblis is like the father of Satan. <laughs> Satans, satanic beings, forces, creatures, existences. He refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. An interesting statement. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. And they bowed down. Bowing down could symbolize two things. Bowing down could symbolize the superiority or potential superiority of one being over another. And so they bowed down to them. Bowing down could also mean that they serve yeah. that creature in some respect. Of course, the Quran says that all beings serve God, all created beings serve God. But this verse seems to be indicating, and the rest of the Quran will make it clear, that these angelic beings, these angelic uh, uh, entities, will serve the development of mankind. We'll even see later that the satanic beings serve the development of mankind. Both forces, angelic and satanic, will serve the development of mankind. Because one will present man with a choice to do the most altruistic things. The other will simultaneously try to influence man in the opposite direction. And so human, human beings will be moral creatures and will have to make moral decisions. And it's in those moral decisions that they will grow spiritually and morally as human beings. And they'll take that into the next life. And the angelic and the satanic forces will be catalysts for those moral choices that they make. They will heighten the human being's awareness of the rightfulness and the wrongfulness of the choice he's about to make. And the self, the soul, the nefs, as they say in Arabic, will have to make the ultimate choice between good and evil. And that choice, that test will come again and again and again as human beings either grow or decline. And those tests will come again and again and again to try to help him towards his spiritual evolution to bring him back, but that choice is ultimately ours. <clears throat> but I'm getting ahead of myself. And so we've said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bow down. down. But, but not, not so Iblis. Iblis, Iblis is, is Satan, Satan, this rebellious force, this evil prompter, the one who whispers, whispers into the human heart. heart. He comes into being. <clears throat> and, and with, with the, the introduction, introduction of Satan, Satan, we have the introduction of evil, that evil influences on human beings. And notice why Iblis does not bow down. He refuses because he was arrogant. You know, we often hear the, what's the root of all evil? In the West, it's always money, greed, etc. Here the Quran says that, seems to be saying that the root of all evil is not always material wants. It's not always money. It's not always greed. At the heart of evil is arrogance. Yeah. Putting yourself above all others. Yeah. Of assigning to yourself special priority and neglecting the rights of others, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of pride and arrogance and envy, the source of evil. He was of those who reject faith. I looked at that verse and I said, okay, I mean, I get why you would create angels to sort of influence man in a positive direction. But why in this story now are you introducing Satan? What sort of role does, does Satan play? And then, of course, you just think about it for a minute and you say, yes. The story is telling us that on one hand, we have these magnanimous urgings come from one direction. On the other hand, we have these satanic urgings coming from another direction. 
In other words, the Quran is telling us that man is not only a learning creature, but he's a moral creature. He has understanding of right and wrong. And God infuses those, allows those influences to come to him. Man is not only an intelligent being, but a moral being. <clears throat> and so, you know, the Quran is not all that difficult to understand. You just sort of read it, I found, and you just sort of follow your nose through it and see what it's saying. <clears throat> I'm sure as most of you in the audience know. <clears throat> okay, so we see that man is not only a learning creature, but he is a a moral being as well. There's another verse in the Quran. It says, by the soul and that which whispers into it, or it which breathes into it. It's morality, it's immorality, and it's God consciousness. Both of these we are, we are under the influence of. And God allows us to be under the influence of this. He creates us to, to be exposed to both influences. And then the verse says, truly he is successful who causes it to grow causes his soul, his self, his real self, to grow. And truly he is lost, who stunts it, who disallows, who, who destroys his personal growth. So mankind is not only an intellectual being, but a moral being. And we said in the next verse, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near of this tree, for then you will be among the wrongdoers. I looked at this first and I was, you know, starting to wonder if the author was drifting back to the old story again. I was confused. And we said, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in a garden and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I thought it was drifting back to the old story. Man sins, man's punished for his sins with earthly life. Maybe the author is drifting, he had a good idea, and now he's drifting back to the sort of traditional story. Maybe he couldn't man, make his mind up what story he wanted. Except for a couple things about this verse, and this happened with almost every verse as I read through it, is that uh, the whole tenor of the passage is sort of out, not the, what you would expect. I noticed that the Quran in this story has a tremendous penchant for understating things. Because it says... Uh, and said to Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish to Adam and his spouse. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I mean, there's no sense of God being threatened by the possibility of man eating from the tree. In this story, we don't see that, you know, in this verse, we don't see that God is nervous at the prospect, that he's threatened by the prospect, that he's anxious about it. The tree that he picks, he picks it seems like he's just picking out any tree. Nothing special about the tree. Go not near uh, this tree for you will be among the wrongdoers. Satan will later come to him and tell him it's a tree of eternal life, of a kingdom that never decays. It turns out to be a complete faucet in his part. Nothing special about the tree. It's just a tree. God's not nervous at the prospect at all. You know, in the tradition that I came from, God is threatened by the prospect. He has, he has to put, to put an angel, angel with a fiery sword, 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 sword by, by to protect, protect the tree. tree. So that mankind never goes next to it again. I'm not putting it down. I'm just pointing out the difference of the story. They're both beautifully told. But they say, you know, it has to guard the tree. Why? Because if they eat from it, they'll become gods like us. So this man, he already has a rebellious nature. Can you imagine if he eats from the, this tree? No. Can't let him get near that tree. <clears throat> but here, just, you know, calmly says... You know, but if you do, you will be among the wrongdoers. God is not worried about himself. It's just warning man. Make it clear that if you do this, you've committed a wrongful deed. <clears throat> Again, the, the, the whole tenor, tenor of the path, path all, all these verses that you read through it is God knows exactly what he's doing. Okay, next verse. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said... Go you all down, some of you being the enemies of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. What, I said? <laughs> I mean, you know, I was expecting now the rage, the anger, the violence, the jealousy. That's what I was expecting. Okay, they eat from the tree. Where's the rage, the violence? I'm going to punish you now. You're going to sweat on earth. 
And you're gonna suffer and you're gonna stub your toe and you're gonna work and you're gonna labor. And you're gonna die there for what you did. And where is the woman? Right? <laughs> and the woman. Right? She's the one who's gonna suffer the most. Right? She'll have to suffer labor pains and monthly cycles. Right? And bleeding and crying out when her children come into the world. She'll scream out. And worst of all, the greatest humiliation, the man will rule over her. <laughs> when he's obviously her intellectual inferior because she and the angels seduced, she and, she, she and Satan seduced him and he just bumbled along and didn't commit a real, you know, wrong deed. <laughs> well, I don't mean to make light of it. But the story is obviously different though. You know, no, no threat here. As a matter of fact, look at the way it says, Oh, Adam, dwell you, you and your spouse, in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. Then they make the mistake. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, Go all you down. Some of you being enemies of others will be adversaries of others. Some of you will be adversaries of each other. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. This is not a deity losing it. If you look at it, I mean, on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. That's not the words of a, of a God that has got lost, you know, that is really extremely upset. On earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. When I walked into the hotel today and they said, uh, and it's this nice one up there, I don't know the name, of, I can't remember the name of it, but that's a continental breakfast. And they said, uh, your room will be room uh, 111, and uh, there's a continent, continental breakfast in the morning. I didn't say, <gasps> you know, I didn't think they were mad at me. You know, because they said, you know, you're going to sleep here, and this is going to be your provision in the morning. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but notice something else about this verse. I mean, when you read these verses for the first time, I don't know, maybe I'm nuts. And many people think I am. But when you read these verses for the first time, I mean, this is just so much that catches your attention. But Satan caused them to slip. I remember, I, I couldn't get that verse out of, that, those words out of my head. Satan caused them to slip? To slip? The greatest sin in the history of the human race, and it's called a slip? You know, in my culture, slip means, you know, you just momentarily, for a fraction of a second, you lose your focus. It's not a big deal. My Uncle Bob used to always say to me, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry I'm five minutes late. I slipped up. You know, the understanding is it's no big deal. It's just a slip. You know, that's what we say when we make a minor mistake. I slipped up. Don't worry about it. Never happen again. A slip, I said? Momentary loss of focus? The greatest sin in the history of humanity? Why we're all here? Why we're all suffering? Why we experience death? A slip? I didn't believe it. I went to my Arabian friends at that time. I didn't know any Arabic. It came to this verse. We, we went, went through, through it line by line. line. I said, now don't change any words. Just read them one at a time. <laughs> but Satan uh, made them, and I said, okay, this one. This one right, right here. here. What, what does, does it mean? mean? Tell, Tell me what, what that, that means. means. They looked at it, it says, uh, slip. <laughs> <laughs> slip. And expelled them from the state in which they were. A slip, I thought? But then maybe I was trying to force the traditional understanding, the traditional interpretation. Maybe it was just a slip. I mean, after all, they didn't commit murder. They didn't commit robbery, rape, pillaging, assault. They ate, they ate, a, they ate a couple of pieces of fruit. <laughs> it's not That's the, the greatest, greatest in the history of humanity by any means. And then the next verse says, and then they were expelled from the state in which they were. Well, what state were they? Let's see now. Let's go back from where we started. First, mankind is being taught. We see he's an intellectual being. Then we show he's a moral being. Moral being means he's a being that's going to have to make choices. And then God gives him this choice. It's not a huge deal. It's not the gravest sin in the history of humanity by any means. It's minor by any standards. They make it, though. We see that God originally intended to put man on earth as his vicegerent. We see a period of preparation where he's being prepared intellectually, where he's growing intellectually, where he's growing as a moral creature. When does God finally put him on earth? What signals that he's ready to begin? 
He makes his first independent choice. It's not the worst deed in the history of humanity. It's minor on anybody's scale, but it shows that mankind is ready to act on his own, to be his own, to make his own choices, that God has empowered him to make choices, and he's ready to make them and carry them out and see them most often to their expected ends, if God wills. <clears throat> and that seems to be the only real significance of it. But I thought, maybe I'm getting this wrong. Maybe God just blows off into an angry rampage the next verse. So I look at the next one, and it says, And then Adam received words from his Lord, and he turned, then God turned to him mercifully, for he's off returning, ever merciful. Well, if I had any doubts up till now that God is not enraged by what this has happened, that God hasn't prepared mankind for this choice, for what was eventually going to happen, that all this was preparation for mankind to begin his earthly sojourn in this famous allegory, if I had any doubts before now, I had them, certainly didn't have them after reading this verse. This verse is entirely consoling reaching and merciful, reaching out to mankind in mercy. Mankind goes to earth. He's obviously afraid. He, he obviously, obviously feels, feels remorse. remorse. He's in an unfamiliar environment. And what, what does God, God do? do? He turns to him. He turns to him. In Arabic, the word is like, has the meaning of like a father turning towards an infant or a child or somebody or a parent, a mother turning towards a child. And he turns to him mercifully and he for God is off returning, ever merciful. And Adam receives words from his Lord. What kind of words? Probably words of consolation, words of hope, words to tell him not, not to be scared. And in the next verse, we see those are exactly the type of words that Adam receives. He says, go down, Adam and his spouse, go down from the state, all of you together. Repeating that again, just so that we know that this is not a punishment here. Go down from the state, all of you together, and truly there will come to you guidance from me. And whoever follows my guidance has nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. It is, a, it is an emotional picture. This young couple, young couple, is here you know, in, in fear, in, in shame, feeling remorse. And God reaches out to them and turns towards them and tells them, you have nothing to fear, nor shall you grieve. I know this is tough for you, but you've been prepared for it. Up, all, up till now, through your entire existence. It had to happen. This is a necessary stage in your development, in your growth, but just hang in there. Follow my guidance. Be true to me, and I'll be true to you. I'll guide you. I'll help you. I'll do whatever you need. Just follow my guidance, and you have nothing to fear, nor shall you agree. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I was impressed. You know, I thought... This author, whom I didn't know, I thought was extremely brilliant. Because the story is entirely coherent, but it's bringing out entirely new meaning. And it's stressing some things in the human equation that I would never have normally thought of. Actually, I thought these sort of things argued against the existence of God. Here, the author was using them to say, look at these. These, these play, play a, a fundamental, fundamental role in the, the purpose, purpose of life. life. What? Intellect. Human beings have intellect right. in response to the angel's question. They are moral creatures, and they are subjected to evil and angelic promptings, and they have to choose between them again and again and again throughout their existence, and their growth, which the Quran talks about frequently, is going to depend on that. We're here to grow, as we will see. But it emphasizes choice. Human beings are creatures of choice. It also emphasizes suffering. Suffering. Hey, that's pretty nice writing. It also emphasizes suffering. Human beings are going to suffer here on earth. That's the first thing that the story mentions. Spread corruption and shed blood? Havoc, suffering, pain? Yes, these three things play a central role somehow, the story is saying, in our development on earth, in our very purpose of our development. These are the three things we've always had the most trouble grappling with all theologies have. Why give us intellect? If it leads us often to challenge in our minds the existence of God, if we can't reconcile the existence of God with our minds, with our reason, why give us choice if we can choose to do wrong? Just make us angels. Why let us suffer so on earth? Just pop us into heaven. 
And here the Quran is telling that these play essential roles in our, in our attaining of faith. Not only these, of course, it also mentions guidance, God's forgiveness, revelation, etc., angelic forces, satanic temptation. It mentions all these other things as well. But these three essentially really caught my attention. <coughs> I never expected that these three things would be emphasized. And so as I read through the Quran, I looked, anytime I saw anything that seemed to relate to this, I would write down notes and underline it. You know, and I would walk up and down in San Francisco with my pen as I'm walking, because I like to walk about seven miles every day, and I'd be underlining. My friends would always say, Jeff, what book are you reading? And I would lie to them, I'd tell them, oh, it's a great novel or something. You know, I didn't want them to know that I was reading the Quran. I think they thought I was going nuts. <laughs> but in any case, so uh, very quickly, I was wondering, does the Quran really emphasize reason? Does it really emphasize choice? Does it really emphasize suffering? How much more time do I have, uh, Madam Speaker? 35? 25, okay. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. So let me just try to indicate to you as I read through the Quran, and I'll try to get through this quickly because you guys look tired. And I know you're interested to find out how that basketball game is turning out. <laughs> Uh, let's see, does the Quran really emphasize reason as essential to human growth, to this experience we're having on earth, to our very purpose? And the answer is definitely yes. So, so much, much so, so that, that even Western, Western Orientalists, Orientalists, people who wrote against the Quran, and said that this is a major feature of the Quran, a feature that you cannot miss. Henri Lamens, writing in the early part of this century, the fame, one of the famous Orientalists, you know, who wrote very much against Muslims, hoping to unseat them from their religious belief. He wrote, the Quran, and this is a quote, is not far from considering unbelief as an infirmity of the human mind. Unbelief is, he thought, and he was saying it mockingly, is like, you know, you can't think straight. You're not using your mind right, as my father used to say. <clears throat> uh, Maxime Rodinson wrote at length about the, the rationalistic approach, approach of the Quran, of the Quran to faith. faith. And, and this, this rational tone of the Quran is one of its most salient features, beyond doubt. I'll just give you a few quotations. Is that one of its fundamental themes is that people ignore or reject God's signs and corrupt religion precisely because they do not use their reason. And the Quran will say that again and again and again. The Quran says about the disbelievers, they refuse to reason and are a people who do not reason. I have seven such quotes in the Quran. The, uh, the Quran will say, will you not reason? It mentions that 14 times to the reader. God reveals signs and lessons and admonitions so that, and this is a quote from the Quran, perhaps, perhaps you will finally use your reason. There are eight such statements in the Quran. From the Quran's viewpoint, reason and faith are allies, just as illogic and false belief are allies. And it clearly sets the conflict along these lines. It says the right way has henceforth become clear from error. Those who benefit most from the Quran are persons of insight. 16 such statements in the Quran. Firmly rooted in knowledge, eight such statements. Use the reason, 10 such statements. Stand on clear evidence and proof, seven such statements. Those who oppose this revelation are deluded, nine such statements. In manifest error, 28 such statements. Ignorant, 15. Foolish, three. Have no understanding, nine. Only follow surmise and conjecture, nine. And blindly adhere to tradition, multiple, multiple times. So it states that. In an almost Socratic style, the Quran repeatedly quizzes the reader and calls into question his or her assumptions. Again and again, it asks us, what do you think? 18 such statements. Have you considered this or that? 13. Did you suppose? Seven. Sounds like a math teacher. Do they not ponder? Two such statements. Do you think? Do you even think? 18 such statements. The message is clear. To gain truer faith, we need to free ourselves from inherited notions and examine our beliefs rationally. Learning plays a key role in human development. Read the Quran, exhorts the reader. For God taught us the use of the pen and taught humankind what it otherwise could not know. In life, nature, and history, in the Quran, there are signs and lessons for those who are wise. There are 21 such statements. The Quran states over 100 times that it has been revealed to make things clear. I thought the author of this Quran must have had a strong mathematical insight, you know, a natural mathematician. All throughout, when I was reading, I was trying to imagine what he must have been like. 
God teaches humanity both directly and indirectly, and sometimes so subtly that we are unaware of his instruction. Thus he tests us in multifar multifarious ways. Of course, I just want to make it clear, Muslims believe the Cor uh, God himself is the, the author of the Quran. You know, sometimes I give this speech, speech and people, people come, come away and, and ask me, Jeff, who is the author of the Quran, anyway? <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, was, I didn't know. So I was just trying to make, figure it out. Repetition is indicative of the importance given to certain ideas. It should be observed that the Arabic word for knowledge in the Quran, erum, appears 854 times in the text in its various forms. It's one of the most frequently occurring words. So the Quran really does put great emphasis on reason in our spiritual quest. Does it put great emphasis on choice? Well, here's what it has to say. Let there be no compulsion in religion. The right way is henceforth clear from error. It's a choice, and it must be freely made. And it's a choice between correctness and error, between right and error, between reason and falsity. Had God willed, he could have indeed guided you all, it says in the Quran. Why not, I thought. Why not just guide us all? Why let some of us choose to go this way and that way? The Quran is constantly provoking me as I read it. Do not the unbelievers know that had God willed, he could have guided all mankind? Oh, do not the believers know that had God willed, he could have guided all mankind? Okay, I'm an unbeliever, I thought. Tell me, why didn't you guide all mankind? If you want us to be in conformity of your will, just make us that way. And if we had so willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. Why did you let us be creatures of choice? Just program us to do the right thing. Never make a wrong choice. Had God willed, he could have made us all one community. He could have made us clones of one another. But he didn't. It wasn't part of his plan. Enlightenment has come from your Lord. He who sees does so to his own good. He who is blind is so to his own hurt. It's your choice. Says it again and again in the Quran. Remember when I was reading this, I was a disbeliever. You know? And I, this scripture is constantly reminding me, it's your choice, Jeff. <laughs> it's no compulsion in this. It's your choice. It's up to you. You, know, you don't, you know, you're not, my, you're probably not reasoning correctly here. Think a little harder. Come on, try. It's just a few more steps. And whoever is guided is only to his own gain. And whoever is stray, I am only a warner. It's your choice. We have revealed to you the book with the truth for mankind. He who lets himself be guided does so as for his own good. He who goes astray, it's his own, to his own hurt. It's his choice. And there are many, many such references. I'll stop there. But you get the point. The Quran clearly emphasizes that choice plays a key role in our development. But what about suffering? I mean, you know, suffering's the biggie, right? I mean, that's the real major question. What does the Quran have to say about suffering? You know, because every religion deals with suffering in a different way. You know, it's either something you have to be saved from, and so, so some, some religions, religions stress, stress salvation, salvation, or it's something that you have to sort of transcend through med meditation and training so you can sort of not feel it so much, get above it and beyond it. Some religions see it as primarily punishment. Some see it as some of the more ancient religions see it as the result of the precarious and whimsical you know, control of many gods working against each other, playing with human beings. Different religions have dealt with it in different ways. But almost all of them, I would indeed say all of them, have sort of seen it as something not so good. But let's see what the Quran has to say about it. Something, something to, to be avoided, avoided to transcend it, to be saved from. The Quran says, just the opposite. You are going to experience it. You will suffer in this life. And it plays a fundamental role in your development and your growth and in what you are to become. This scripture didn't just say you're going to experience it. It said you should embrace it. You should struggle through it. Your life should be a struggle, it says. It should be a jihad. <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> But that's, that's what it says. 
jihad means struggle. When a Quran most says jihad, it's very seldom, it's most often not in the context of fighting. Qatal is the Arabic word for fighting. But you know, it says even in the Mecca verses, long before Muslims had to defend themselves against their oppressors, it mentions that you have to struggle in the path of God. With the Quran, it even says. Struggle in the path of God with this Quran. Life is a struggle. It says in one verse, most assuredly we will try you with something of danger and hunger and the loss of worldly goods, with the loss of your lives and the fruits of your labor. Most assuredly we will try you. It's not just talking about evil people, good people. But give the good news, the glad tidings, be happy for those who are patient in adversity and suffering. Good news, I thought? Doesn't the author understand the terrible effects of suffering? Give the good news to those who are patient through adversity, who when calamity befalls them say, truly unto God we belong and truly unto him we shall return. In other words, that this could benefit them. It's a remarkable statement. Here's another one. Do you think that you could enter paradise without having the like of those who passed away before you? And the next verses start to explain that these people were good people who suffered terribly. Do you think that you could enter paradise without, having going, through this, without going through the same? Why, I thought. Why do, do you have, why do we have to suffer in life? Misfortune and hardship befell them, and so shaken were they that the apostle and the believers with them would exclaim, when will God's help come? These are good people. <laughs> When will God's help come? Oh, truly, God's help is always near. You will certainly be tried in your possessions and yourselves, the Quran tells the reader. You're going to face hardship. It's guaranteed. Every soul must taste of death. And we try you with calamity and prosperity, both as a means of trial. And to us, you are returned. You are going to have hardship here. There is going to be no, no heaven on earth. This is a vi environment is made to be an environment of adversity. It is made to be an environment where you have to work, where you have to struggle, where you have to strive. And it plays a key role. Oh man, truly you've been toiling to your Lord in painful toil, but you shall meet him. You're toiling, yes, but you shall meet him. We certainly created man to face distress. What, I thought? We certainly have created man to face distress. You made us to face distress? Does he think that no one has power over him? Sometimes people get, you know, so, so down, they just think, oh, it's, uh, this, no one's, this can't be a God, and look how I'm suffering. He would say, I have wasted much wealth. Some people just become totally devoted to worldly age. Does he think that no one sees him? Have we not given him two eyes to see with, a tongue? And two lips to communicate with, to learn from by communicating? Can he see around him? Can he tell from communication with other people? Haven't we pointed out to him the two conspicuous ways? <coughs> what, what are the two, two conspicuous, conspicuous ways? ways? But, but he attempts, attempts not the uphill up. climb. One of them is the uphill climb. And he says, this is the way you should be pursuing. And what will make you comprehend the uphill climb? It is to free a slave or to or feed, feed in a day, a day of, of hunger. hunger. An orphan nearly related, or the poor one lying in the dust. Then he or she is of those who believe and exhorts one another to patience and exhorts one another to mercy. You have not attained to faith until you struggle the uphill climb. It's telling us you should pursue the uphill climb. What is the uphill climb? Reaching out to your fellow man who's in his, who suffers. To feed the poor one to help the poor soul that's lying in the dust. And all over the world there are people in that state. And we watch the news as if it's just entertainment. And the Quran tells us this is something you should involve yourself in. That is the road that you should travel. It describes a successful life as an uphill climb. Well, I can see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna have to tie this up in about 15 minutes, I guess. <clears throat> but, Definitely the Quran emphasizes these three elements in the human drama. But as I read through it, I couldn't.
just going to pause it there because the YouTube video has actually got about 30 minutes. I know he's saying um, that he's got to wrap it up in about 15 minutes. So I'm guessing he does some questions and then goes on to talk about it. But I think that's a good time to, to, to pause it. And then we'll do part three with the last 30 minutes. So he definitely touches on some really, really good points there. What I like about Jeffrey Lang is he talks in a language that I understand, and I don't mean a language as in the English language. He talks in, I guess he communicates in a way that um, really resonates with me. He asks questions that I would ask, I guess is what I'm saying. So he 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 talks about, um, you know, questions that I would want to know. He says it in a way that, I guess the way that my brain would think and a way that I would um I would want to pursue if 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 I was going down this path as well. I like the fact that he has stats as well. Like he was saying, you know, this was brought up 20 times and this was brought up 10 times and this was brought up seven times. Um, and I like the way that he he says, you know, in context, this word, this means this but it's used in the, like the word jihad. You know, for us, it means, you know, in the Western world, it's seen as, oh, you know, it's not necessarily seen as a good word, but in the Quran, he's he's talking about how it's seen as a battle. Uh, sorry, a struggle, not a battle. Sorry, a struggle. It's seen completely differently. And I think that was really, really important to understand. So when I talk about, I like the way that he he talks in a language that I understand. What I mean is he communicates in a language that someone like me being an atheist, yeah, it really makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm really looking forward to part three. I hope you are as well. Um, so I'll pause that right sort of on the one hour and three second mark. Um, so I hope you do join us for part three where we're going to listen to the last 31 minutes. Um, and if you haven't watched part one, please do go back and watch it. So part two was really, really awesome. The purpose of life, Jeffrey Lang, Islam on demand. Um, please come back for part three. I've really enjoyed it. Really, really think he's a great speaker. I'm really, really liking him. I'm glad that um, I've had the opportunity to listen to him. And as I said, I'm really keen to watching part three. Thank you so much. You're watching Gyms. Make sure you do subscribe, share Gyms with your loved ones, friends and family. My name's Melissa Mitchell from here in Australia. Until next time, you're watching Gyms. And um, yeah, take care and we'll see you then. Bye.